Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And Happy New Year to all of you. Happy New Year. You know, uh, I was trying to think of the theme today. I was going to say it's uh, down the floor and out the door. <laughs> uh, but that's obvious. But it really is about uh, the, the end and the beginning. It's not the beginning of the end. <laughs> well, it could be. But it really is about transition. And it's about ending an era and starting a new era. And I want to focus on that today as we go throughout uh, our morning. And I want to make sure that you're listening to the wonderful opportunities that each of us has in changing lives. And not prejudging, not stereotyping, but looking for opportunities that we can assist someone who wants to be helped. And that's going to be kind of a theme that we're going to be looking at today. And we're very, very fortunate to have a wonderful colleague from UCSV who's here today to help us think about that, remind us what our roles are and what we can do about it. So, with that, I'd like to uh, recognize some special people that are here today. Um, you know, we work on behalf of the trustees of the San Luis Obispo County Community College District. We have five individuals who are, volunteer their time as trustees to help set policy and help set direction for this institution. And I'd like to introduce three of those that are here today, and one's going to be arriving a little bit later. So let me first introduce the president of the Board of Trustees, uh, Dr. Barbara George. Also here today is Trustee Pete Sizak. Pete? He's in plain clothes today. <laughs> and also uh, our newest trustee, but a real quest of champion, uh, Mary Strobridge. <laughs> and he did make it. And also, one of the longest serving trustees and former president of the board, uh, Pat Mullen. So today's program is about uh, recognition, about celebration, and about uh, transition. Uh, we're going to um, introduce new employees, new permanent employees who have been hired since our last, uh, since opening day in August. We're going to recognize people who have been approved by the Board of Trustees that are planning on retiring this year who have, or have recently retired. And then I've asked uh, Vice President uh, Richardson to give you an update on where, where the institution is on the presidential search process so you kind of have an idea of what's going to come down in the timeline and so on. We're going to recognize a special person today with the um, with the awarding of the Elaine Holly Coates Service Excellence Award. Um, and then uh, we will have a special presentation from our guest, Victor Rios. And then I will conclude the program this morning with, uh, with my remarks. So at this time, I'd like to ask the, uh, the Vice Presidents to come forward. We're going to be introducing the new employees, permanent employees, um, in their particular area. So if they all come up at the same time, Mark and Dan and so we have uh, Dr. Mark Sanchez, our Vice President of Student Services. We have Dan Troy, our Vice President of Administrative Services. We have Dr. Deborah Wolf, our Vice President of Academic Affairs. And Melissa Richardson, our Vice President of Human Resources and Labor Relations. So, you're kicking it off? I'm kicking it off. Okay. All right, kick it off. <laughs> Good morning, Cuesta College. Good morning. It's a Friday, it's a three-day weekend. Can we do a little bit better than that? Good morning, guys. It's my honor to introduce uh, some new faces that we have at uh, in Student Services. So I'll go ahead and start off with um, Linda Agents in Admissions and Records. Is Linda here? Woo! 
She's an admissions and records technician. We also have Jeffrey Alexander, our new director of outreach, orientation, and success activities. Welcome. Yeah. To Elise Coloca. So Elise. She's an instructional support specialist in the Student Success Center. Welcome. Uh, Ruth Cook. Ruth Cook, welcome. Counseling assistant in our counseling and guidance department. Rasha Dimitir. Rasha here. Rasha is our new financial aid technician in the financial aid department. Uh, Christine Groff. Christine is our new DSPS accommodation assistant. Uh, Sarah Latimer. Sarah is also the new admissions and records technician. And last but not least, Malka Stein. Malka. Assistant and counseling and guidance. Welcome. That's that's the new team members for spring 2018. Thanks, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Looking forward to another term and also a three-day weekend. That sounds good. Um, so uh, I have arranged the names of our new employees at Administrative Services in alphabetical order. So the uh, first, I'd like to introduce Jacob Hafner. Jacob, is he here? Stand up. Uh, and that's the end of my list. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome back. Most of you haven't left, but welcome back. And uh, I have a list also, and so I'd like you to stand up, raise your hand, and then everyone can introduce themselves to you afterwards so they can identify who you are. So in the toddler and preschool assistant teacher, Lam Poon Chuck. As a department assistant, Mallory Cronin. Uh, the CPAC supervisor, Joan Herwitt. And interim director of the Children's Center, has Katie Mervin. Division Department Assistant in Music and Drama is Michelle Peters. Michelle. Um, the Ag Science Lab Technician, we have Troy Quimby. It's hard to get him out of that facility, that new facility. Uh, South County Center's Assistant is Senna Vasquez. And the fine arts ceramic technician, Cody Winkleplek. And then uh, the administrative assistant, scheduling assistant to the Dean of Academic Affairs, and that is Michelle Wright. Okay, excuse me, I have a little bit of a scratchy throat, so <clears throat> for faculty retirement, Ruth Bearing, Madeline Lamont, Steve Mueller, excuse me, they've already, they're already gone, so. <laughs> um, Suzanne Ying, and one that's currently here who's retiring at the end of spring, Don Norton. <laughs> Classified Management and Confidential, Betta Nurt. His last official day is today, Sean Landers. Landers. Robert Madeline. And last, but definitely not least, Dr. Stork. So a quick update on the president recruitment. We are moving forward. Um, interviews are planned for February 13th and 14th. Um, uh, forum, save the date, will be going out very soon, February 20th. That will be on campus. Um, again, save the date, keep an eye out for that. And then finalist interviews with the Board of Trustees is March 1st. And
And um, I can say not too much about it, but we're confident that our next president is going to be found. Please make sure you get a new president. <laughs> Well, the next uh, presentation is to recognize um, <clears throat> the recipient of the Elaine Hollycoat Service Excellence Award. Um, this award was um, uh, renamed in honor of Elaine Hollycoats, who was the very first classified employee, uh, employee hired at Cuesta College in 1964. Um, Elaine is alive and well, she's 91 years old, and she still keeps track of what we are doing. <laughs> and, um, and we have some wonderful friends in the foundation office that stay very close to her and, and uh, make sure she's taken care of. She lives about two blocks from Dr. Martinez, who just turned 96. And so they, uh, they talk every day and they uh, keep telling the old lies that, uh, <laughs> that we know are running around the halls. Uh, memory. Uh, but Elaine was the true, it was the epitome of professionalism. She still cannot call me Gil. She still refers to Dr. Martinez and myself as Dr. Martinez and Dr. Stork. She just, as that consummate professional. She set the bar, she set the standard uh, for what service excellence is all about. Today's recipient, unfortunately, is sick. Like, like many, you have been, and, and people in your family, this is a very, very difficult um, illness that's going around. I'm on the board of uh, directors of Sierra Vista Hospital, and, and I get the, uh, the updates almost on a daily basis of how serious you know, this flu is. You know, both hospitals and the tennis system are full. They're shuttling patients back and forth in order to take advantage of the hospitalists that are at uh, Sierra Vista. Uh, they are discouraging physicians uh, not to do elective surgeries right now to keep people out of the hospital. Uh, so it is a really critical time. So please take care of yourselves and take this, this flu seriously. It, it is. Todd's been out all week. Poor uh, Cindy has been left uh, with uh, managing the board meeting on Wednesday night and then taking care of the logistics today. So thank you, Cindy, for that. <laughs> but I do want to announce that the, uh, the award winner, we are videoing this, so she'll have an opportunity to see it live. I mean, not live, but see it in real. And then we'll do a special presentation with her when she's able to come back. So the, uh, the, the award winner that uh, I felt was extremely deserving of this award. We have some wonderful applicants, and thank you for you know, thank you for nominating these people because they only get to my attention if you take the time and recognize your colleagues and send in those nominations. And this was one of the best and most difficult pools to evaluate and to make a selection on. So this uh, re recipient of the Elaine Holly Code Service Election Award goes to Estella Vasquez. Estella, it is very clear that we all love you and we miss you and we hope you get uh, well fast. Um, let me tell you what the nominees said about Estella. Estella is dedicated, she's certainly student-centered, she's certainly passionate, and she's always helpful. She's been an instrumental partner in the college's equity efforts, especially focused on advocacy for underrepresented students. She's dedicated to student success, understanding that to achieve student success, she must unselfishly 
be available at all times. She can relate to the struggles students face and her motivation is absolutely contagious. She provides students with a vision and the support needed to achieve their goals. Acela first started the first Student Dreamers Club at Quest to support undocumented students and was the lead organizer on Quest's first Supporting the Dream conference. She's the president of the Cuesta College chapter of the Latina Leadership Network. She's the lead on doing undocumented ally trainings to staff, students, and the faculty. But most importantly, Alpha Stella always has a smile on her face and always finishes her conversation with Tener un día maravilloso y productivo, mis amigos. I was going to really impress her with my, my, uh, my Google translation. <laughs> but what she says all the time, have a wonderful and productive day, my friends. That is Estela Vasquez. So congratulations, Estela. check for you. <laughs> no, you'll get it. It's, and it's on film, so you know you'll get it. <laughs> At this time, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Wolf to come forward and she will introduce our keynote speaker today. Thank you. Good morning again. Um, we have a very special day today. Um, before I introduce uh, Dr. Rios, I want to talk a little bit about Cuesta and what, we, what has happened over the last several years. You know, between 2008, I would say, and 2014, we had a lot of hard work. But even in, with all that hard work, we always thought about our students. And what is really important is that every one of us has the ability to touch a student and make a difference. And I don't care if you're in the president's office, if you're in HR, if you're in facilities, if you're in EOP and S, if you're in academic affairs, all across this campus, we all have an opportunity to change a student's life. With that, you're gonna hear one of our student alums to do an opening for Dr. Rios. But I also wanna thank uh, Quay Dang, who as you all know, you all know Quay, Quay stand up, who is our equity, <laughs> our equity and our uh, Student Success Center directors. Uh, if you haven't walked up to our Student Success Centers, you can see the difference we're making in students' lives. And we're lucky because we have the equity dollars. And part of the equity dollars is to bring professional development for all of us. So we're all on the cutting edge of what's happening. So, like I said, we had some hard years, but as you recall in 2014, when we were ending that time, we talked about being the best. We talked about innovation. We looked at how can we make a difference in students' lives, and that equity money has really helped us look at things a little bit differently. So with that, I'm going to introduce Mario Espinoza, who is an alum. Mario Espinoza, doctoral student at the University of California, Santa Barbara, an alumni of Cuesta College and Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and a health policy research fellow with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, an alum of the California State University Board of Trustee Scholarship for Outstanding Achievement, the Cal Poly President's Diversity Award, Lavender Leadership Award, and the Ethnic Studies Department's Outstanding Senior Award. I have been recognized by the California State Legislature Assembly Board and am a permanent member of the Alpha Gamma Sigma Academic Honor Society. And today, I have the great honor of introducing Dr. Victor Rios to you all. He has been a mentor, a friend, and an important part of my academic family. We share similar tracks in our journeys into academia. We both have been taught to search for a better life, and I, for one, did not expect to have landed into a PhD program at this point in my life. The way that I entered into the world of education was through forging personal relationships with students, staff, and faculty. As he has recently presented at his TED Talk on PBS, it takes more than being on the right path 
It takes having the positive credentials and someone to believe in you for disadvantaged students like myself to believe in themselves and be successful. As he said, it took a teacher to care, reach out, and manage to tap into the soul. For me, it took more than a high GPA and the know-how to get to where I stand with all my credentials. It took personal one-on-one -on -one relationships with faculty and a supportive community that expressed their desire to help me succeed and provide resources that, and pathways for me to do so. As an undergraduate at Cuesta College, I was a part of the Extended Opportunities Program and Services, where I met Julianne Jackson, April McGee, Dee Limon, Janet Flores, and Heidi Weber. Without them, I would not have known what I was doing when I started as a re-entry student while my father was dying from cancer. It was through them that I learned how to effectively manage my time, build my schedule accordingly, and reach my academic en endeavors. I built community from the ground up at the UPS, and I was granted the opportunity to begin building my skills in student affairs, meet helpful employees at the Cuesta College Bookstore, the library, and the Student Success Center. Let's not forget, the faculty also played a huge role in my trajectory. Faculty such as Christopher Nielsen, Laurie McConaughey, Peggy Wright, Zachary Paul, Matt Vasquez, Ann Woods, and Bryce Jenkins. I've named these faculty because each of these have taught me a valuable lesson about what it means to reach for the stars as you progress through the education system. They went out of their way to reach out and demonstrate that they cared about my success and personal well-being. Dr. Victor Rios has been monumental in my track in my graduate program. We met in the summer of 2015 as part of an undergraduate summer research program, and I got lucky that he was at his office when I knocked on his door. From then on, we maintained a personal relationship and have been involved in academic opportunities ever since. In fact, the reason I am funded in my PhD program is because he let me know about an external fellowship opportunity that fit within my research interests. He has shown his commitment to the mentoring of students, fostering diversity, and doing what it takes to continue to build a productive and sound environment for students, staff, and faculty. Given how much Dr. Rios has helped me develop into a strong graduate student through his mentorship and the dynamic he creates in our one-on-one -on -one meetings, it is my pleasure to introduce Victor to you all at Quest College, where I started my career in academia and for the very first time had affirmation from teachers and faculty that I had potential. Please welcome Dr. Victor Rios. when you listen to this young man and the influence that uh, many of you had on him and his journey and where he is today. But I'm going to give you a little more uh, details about Victor. Victor Rios is a professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of California, California, Santa Barbara. He received his PhD at the University of California, Berkeley in 2005. Professor Rios' research agenda focuses on the role of social control in determining the well-being of young people living in urban marginality, tracking the social consequences of the punitive state and punitive social control across institutional settings, and examining young people's resilience and responses to social marginalization. He is the author of five books, including Punish, Policing, uh, Policing the Lives of Black and Latino Boys, that was in 2011, Project Grit, Generating Resilience to Inspire Transformation in 2016, and Human Targets, Schools, Police, and the Criminalization of Latino Youth. Um, I want you all to give us a warm welcome to Dr. Rios. Things that he doesn't talk about um, 
in the video is the, the, the many opportunities of mentoring he encountered here. And I clearly asked him about it uh, in our conversation yesterday in person. Um, he's uh, out and about uh, taking care of his business, being a fellow right now, so he couldn't be here. You know, he's forgetting about his humble beginnings. <laughs> but that's okay, I'll, I'll make sure to remind him. Uh, I'm joking, Mario, if you're watching. But um, the point is that, you know, uh, every time we work with someone, it, it, it shouldn't come from a place of pity um, or, or even sympathy. It, it should come from a place of empathy. And, and empathy in a very scientific way, and I'll, I'll get into some of the data that shows how empathy in a scientific way uh, makes a, has a long-term impact on students. Um, but also, you know, looking at Mario's trajectory, we see how um, if he hadn't encountered the person at Cuesta that said to him when he first entered, think of him, picture this. Mario's is, uh, and he would, wouldn't be too shy if I said this, but he, he was a, a, a college, community college dropout. So he had a dropout of another community college. Went to work. And then one day he finds out um, that his father might not make it. And his father eventually uh, passes away. So um, right when he finds out his father might not make it, he says, I want to get my college degree before this happens for my father. And he walks into campus here and, and picture this student with all the weight of the, of the world on him, right? He's considered, again, a college dropout. Um, he has a lot going in his personal life. And picture him walking, I don't know which side of campus, onto campus. And uh, he greets the first person he sees. Who might that be? Just picture who might that be. <laughs> okay, who is this? <laughs> okay, why? That's who you want to greet you when you walk in. <laughs> so what's the name again? Dean. 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 All right. And I gather that you're a, a charismatic you're a charismatic character here on campus. You're welcoming. You have a wonderful, wonderful smile. I already feel welcome to this space by seeing you smile. Um, and you probably make wonderful, wonderful connections in, that create an impact and probably are long lasting. You probably have students that come to you two, five, ten years later and say, because of UD. I am where I'm at today. Yeah. Sir, you mentioned Dean? Yeah. What's your name? Matthew. Matthew. So who else? Holly Oh, Freddie. <laughs> Heidi. 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 Who else? All of us. <laughs> Thank you. Right, that that let's think about it this way, right? Um, that the people that inspire us at the workplace, right, D, Heidi, that we become them, right, that we learn from them, that, that D, right, um, and I'm sure you've done this before, um, comes up one day to the stage in an opening and says, hey, these are my best practices. Right, because we admire her best practices, but do we know the science behind those best practices? So we might say, oh, that's just a characteristic, that's just personality, but, but at a very profound level, right, for someone that studies human development, human interaction, um, there's many, many ways in, we can, in which we can learn from individuals that have a deep impact in the lives of students. And to know that is to take away the idea that, oh, that's not my job, that's D's job. To take away the idea that, well, that's not my job, that's student services job. Oh, I'm just a faculty member, student services can take care of that. Or I'm just X employee, right, working in tech, 
on campus helping with tech. That's student services job. That all of us come together as a community because the very first person that Mario might have encountered may not have been Dean. She might have been busy working with 12 other students at the time. Right? That the very first person he might have encountered might have been someone in groundskeeping. And maybe, just maybe, that someone gave him a simple, ¿Qué pasó? <laughs> Yeah, no, someone's pointing to the que pasó guy. <laughs> what's, his, what's his name? Tommy. Tommy. Oh, Tommy. Que pasó? And is like, oh, huh. Hesitant, right? Because he's not used to warm welcomes. And then he walks down these beautiful little pathways and encounters someone in a little cart. A little golf cart. I don't know, maybe the president. <laughs> That's who rolls in the golf cart around here, right? I don't know who. But some administrator. It was just a quick thing. Oh, I was like, whoa, I'm not used to, like, you know, friendly places like this. It's like dipping at Disneyland or something. <laughs> And then he walks into the student services building and then everyone's smiling at him. Now there's a science behind the smile, there's a science behind the greeting, there's a science behind the warmth. Right? When a person uh, feels uh, welcomed and, and the and the indicator for feeling welcomed is that people, uh, their facial expressions are, are smiles, not frowns. Uh, people are open to you. Their body language even is different. Um, you know, this is kind of a cold body language, closed up. Um, you can participate in that often, just not knowing it. You might be having a hard day. You might be stressed out. You might be thinking about all the bad news out there. And then a student walks by and you're like this, right? Or you could consciously kind of train yourself to be that person that is. You know, not always, not 100% of the time, but why, why not aim for 100% of the time, right? If you, you're doing it 50% of the time, right, why not go for 100%? Maybe you reach 70% of the time where you're catching yourself going from this to, oh, hey, how, how are you? A quick, quick smile, even half smile. <laughs> <laughs> or better yet, preventing yourself from the frown and preventing yourself from the closing with the body language. This is especially important across cultural communication because sometimes race itself, skin color, becomes an indicator that we're different from each other and already there's a disconnect, right? And so for us to connect with students that are of a different background, means that we have to push ourselves a little bit further in creating um, the, the welcoming expressions, the welcoming bo body language, and, and the welcoming uh, conversation. So even like uh, maybe Mario is wandering there in that beautiful central courtyard area, he just, and then someone walks by and says, can I help you with something? You know, even the way that one says it, maybe, maybe better. Like, um, hey, how, how are you today? Can Can I help you find something? Even very subtle expressions uh, make a world of difference. And later on, uh, I'll conclude my presentation with a quintessential uh, place as an example, where some of us go and shop. The name of this place is Trader Joe's. <laughs> everyone laughs, everyone smiles. Think about why we laugh and smile when we talk about Trader Joe's. The other, uh, so before I continue though, I do want to acknowledge a few things. Uh, we're on beautiful land, over 150 acres of land, west of college. It is located on Shumash, uh, Native American land. I want to acknowledge the Shumash people. 
And then I want to also acknowledge uh, the faculty who are not here, um, who in, in their own way have been reaching out to me too, uh, have been uh, carrying on a movement. And um, I've uh, been wanting to have an in-person discussion with them as well, so hopefully we have that opportunity to do so. So I just want to acknowledge them um, in their own day-to-day -day struggles, in their own uh, movement that they have going on. All right, so this idea of self-actualization you see here in the backdrop uh, is simple. And, um, and it becomes uh, an opportunity right, for one to achieve one's goals Self-actualization is the process in which one can uh, have a feeling of dignity, self-determination, independence. So some of you might have taken some psychology classes and learned about uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but essentially the, the story goes like this, that for humans to feel fulfilled, to feel like they're doing something positive in life, they're getting something positive out of life, that they have to feel, um, of course, the basics uh, get fulfilled first, which is like food and shelter. And then the next level is belonging, to feel belonging, part of the community. And then the final level is to um, be successful, have an education, have a career, have a job, be independent, be able to pay the bills. And this is super crucial at the community college level because in many ways community college is often the final frontier of hope for marginalized students. When I work with students on the streets, and I work with them for years, in the uh, streets of Oakland, California, streets of LA, in Watts, uh, in Watts in particular, I work with 40 high school dropout kids, high school pushouts. And our goal was to bring them back to school. And they were 17 years old to 22 years old. You want to guess the only institution that would take them? Not high school. Not LA Unified School District. Not the LA County Office of Education. Not employment development programs, because they only had like one slot for 40 kids. Not the charter schools. Not the community centers, because their funding is, 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 is so tied to performance outcomes that when you take a kid that can't show performance, even though you change their life, but they can't show the outcomes with a higher GPA, with a re-enrollment in school, it's hard to take them in your program. The only institution that took these kids that had criminal records, been seen as complete failures, and had completely lost hope in their education was the community college. So the work that you do here uh, is a work, sometimes, of life or death. Is the work of saving someone from in, uh, ending up in prison, dead, on the streets. I was going to say houseless, but sometimes you work with students that are houseless, right? My uh, father-in-law has been uh, working at San Francisco City College in uh, the counseling department as faculty uh, as well and for 35 years. And he has every single student demographic you can imagine. Um, uh, and, and so every walk of life comes into the community college. And it's our job, right, as a community college, to make every single one of them feel like this is their fr frontier of hope. And that this, this is a place where they can thrive, regardless of who they are, where they come from, where they've been.
And sometimes, you know, we want a more conventional student for some of us, but for others, we took on this challenge. This was our purpose, to help those that have been left behind. So before I continue, I want to just show you a short video clip that talks a little bit about my own journey. Now, another in our series on the nation's high school dropout crisis. Tonight, one man's journey from gang member and dropout to professor, and his efforts to keep other young men from making his mistakes. Ray Suarez has our American graduate story. My name is Victor Rios. In 1994, this was me. I was introduced to the nation in a frontline documentary. I was a gang member a juvenile delinquent, and a high school dropout. But in the 18 years that followed, Victor Rios earned his high school diploma, finished college, earned a PhD from the University of California at Berkeley, and wrote two books on his life and his research on juvenile delinquency. He now teaches sociology at UC Santa Barbara, and helps at-risk youth navigate the perils of adolescence. I'm sure you're closer to some people than others. Rios is also a family man with a wife, Rebecca, and three children. Life is constantly busy. To be this far into the future, I feel like I've lived two lifetimes. Two lifetimes. Let's think about that as a theme. Second chances, the power that educators have in transformation lives. So for some of us, right, we've already lived an entire lifetime by the time we're 20 years old. What do I mean by that? And some of you in the room have been through this in life. Um, maybe taking care of a sibling at a young age. My brother was seven years old. I was three years old. Mom had to go to work. Single mom. Father had abandoned us before I was even born. 10 hours a day was how long she worked for. She would leave the apartment and lock it from the outside so we couldn't open it from the inside. For 10 hours, a seven-year-old had to entertain a three-year-old, keep him clean, keep him fed, and make sure he didn't fall out that second story window. Well, that's a lot of responsibility for a baby. So by the time my brother was 10, 11, he was essentially a grown-up. He was my full-time caretaker. Um, dropped me off to school, picked me up, put me on the bus, walked me for miles places. One time, my mom tells us this story. Uh, two in the morning, we're walking on the streets on a big avenue in Oakland, dangerous place. And uh, my mom was coming from the bar runs into us and says, what are you guys doing? And my brother says, oh, I'm, I'm looking for someone to take care of us. So the kind of suffering, right, the kind of having to grow up at such young ages nowadays, for some young people living in poverty, um, is incredible. And all of those kind of social obstacles that they encounter, um, get embodied, become very personalized, and they show up to the community college wanting an opportunity, and it's sometimes difficult, right, to give them that opportunity. But one of the, uh, the promises here, really, is that the minute that we provide them an environment where they feel safe, where they feel they can start over, where they feel they can start a second lifetime, second opportunity in life is the minute that many of them start to make the switch. And you never know who that person will be. You never know when that transition will happen. It could take a second. It could take five years. So, my uh, my story uh, begins when I'm, I'm very little. Um, my, uh, my mother, uh, 
never really had uh, many opportunities to provide for us. And um, she tried her best. Um, she was undocumented and um, she got a job, uh, her first job in the U.S. And her boss told her, um, I'm gonna pay you whatever I want. And if you tell anyone that I'm paying you below minimum wage, uh, I'm gonna call immigration so they can deport you. So my mom took this little bit of money, and with this little bit of money, she, she got my brother and I this, this tiny little apartment. And this apartment was dilapidated, it was condemned, it was run by a slumlord that just was trying to make money off of poor people. Um, the windows, when the uh, drug addicts would break our window, steal the little that we had, um, the landlord wouldn't replace the window with a regular window, he would put up a piece of plywood and uh, our electricity bill, we often couldn't pay for it, so we had to run an orange extension cord from the neighbor's house just to get a light bulb uh, to turn on in our house. Situation got so bad, I'm growing up in this environment. And one day, my uh, little cousin, he's uh, two months old, he's sleeping in his crib, he's my neighbor. Um, the rats that we had in the house, they crawled on his crib, and they began to chew his face up. They chewed, chewed his lips, his gums, his cheeks. By the time that his um, mom woke up and realized what was happening, he was in a pool of blood. He ended up in the hospital for two months. His little face had to get uh, reconstructed. So by this time, <clears throat> I'm in eighth grade, and I tell myself, man, I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to be poor. I want to get my family out of poverty. So this is when I decided to drop out of school and get a job. See, there's always a reasonable choice, a reasonable reason why people make the choices that we think might be dumb. There's always a reason behind it. So dropping out of eighth grade is not the smartest thing. But as we say on the streets, you know, we, we got to eat. And so that's what I went to go do to find uh, work. And I started pushing lawnmowers uh, for uh, 10 hours a day, pushing lawnmowers. Getting paid a dollar an hour, $10 a day. Uh, I remember being at the rich people's houses in the Oakland Hills. And I remember dream daydreaming about being uh, wealthy one day. I was at this lady's house one day. and She's got this beautiful three-story Spanish tile roof home, and I go to the backyard and I'm mowing the lawn. She has a swimming pool. She even has a statue of a little boy peeing in the pool. <laughs> <laughs> I go to the front of the house, this lady rolls up in a baby blue Mercedes Benz. This lady was older, she had curly white hair. She gets out of her car, she's holding a little white dog with curly white hair. <laughs> And I said to myself, you know, in this daydream, I said, you know, uh, when I grow up, I want this house. I want that swimming pool. I want that little boy peeing in the pool. I want that baby blue Mercedes Benz. And I want that dog with the curly white hair. And if I work hard enough, I'll get the things I want in life. See, coming from the working class, one thing that's guaranteed is that we get a hard work ethic in, ingrained in us, instilled in us from a young age. Sometimes we don't have the skills to translate what that means to this real world, right? But we have a hard work ethic. So I had a hard work ethic, I just wasn't applying it properly. And a lot of people that walk into right, the community college that come from the work and to translate the hard work ethic of working the body, right, uh, to earn a living, right, laboring to earn a living. And many of them have, you know they've had 25 jobs. They still have 25 jobs, right? That, that they already know how to work hard. It's the, the key is the translation from working hard to working smart, right, We're working in this system. And so I didn't realize the, the choice I was making, that I was kind of setting myself up for failure. I ended up uh, uh, 
dropped out for a few months, my mom finds out, she sends me back to school, by this time I'm getting caught up in the street life uh, with the wrong peers, I end up in gangs, I end up in an Anchuvi, three felonies. Um, and here's the irony, right, of uh, uh, teaching people a lesson in our society, whether it's kids that uh, don't do good in school, um, that misbehave at school, or whether it's kids in the juvenile justice system. The irony is this, that we think that teaching someone a lesson is kind of scared straight. That teaching someone a lesson is punishing them harshly. Teaching someone a lesson is locking them up for a long, long time. That's been the trend in the last 40 years in our society. But just one case in point is I get locked up for stealing cars, Grand Theft Auto. And I'm not proud of what I did. Um, but my first car I stole was this little uh, old Toyota Tercel, like a 1982. If your Toyota Tercel got stole back in the 90s and it was an old 80, 80s Tercel, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> it wasn't me because the owner, the owner uh, found out that it, who, who it was and I ended up paying restitution to the owner for damaging their vehicle. But anyway, I get arrested and then as soon as I get booked into juvie, I get told you're going to be taught a lesson. And I'm this 14-year-old kid, and I get thrown into this cell with a 17-year-old kid, and he's supposed to teach me a lesson. His lesson is supposed to beat me up or something. And the kid, he says to me, um, hey, uh, what you in here for? And I said, oh, man, I stole a car. What kind of car? <laughs> I go, this, this Toyota Tercel. Like, man, you should be stealing faster cars than that. <laughs> this is how you do it. And he taught me in, my, in our cell that I need to get a long screwdriver, break the steering column of any high-performance American vehicle like a Chevrolet IROC Z28, Buick Grand National, and there's a little steering rod, and then you just, and then you're good to go. So I get out, guess what I do? Right, so in trying to teach, the irony is that in trying to teach right, people lessons in our society, I and mean, it really is the poor that we're talking about, teaching the poor a lesson, right? Oh, you're poor, you need help from the government, or we're gonna punish you. Oh, you're, you're, you're poor and you want a free handout, we're gonna punish you. Oh, you're poor and you're not following the rules, you're stealing, we're gonna punish you and somehow, and then we have 70% recidivism, right? They keep coming back in and out of the system. How does it affect the community college? Because then we end up educating them, right? And so as educators here, to almost intercept that process is an important role to have. How do you intercept that process? You approach individuals in a non-punitive way because you know that everywhere else they might have, based on the trends, they might have been treated punitively to teach them a lesson. So the, sure we need to p teach people lessons. Sure people need to uh, amend uh, for what they've done. Sure need to, people need to pay back to society the rules they have broken, but it's how they pay back, right? And, and to be civically engaged, to be part of a larger community to not just receive the warmth that you provide for them, but also to be givers of that warmth is an important lesson for them to learn. Anyway, I end up um, in worse situations than that, uh, doing worse things than that, and I'm not learning my lesson until finally one day, my best friend and I were uh, 15 going on 16, uh, went to the other side of town to visit some girls we met, got in a fight with a group of our enemies, and they pull out a gun, and uh, my best friend uh, was shot, and he was killed. And, um, you know, I didn't know who to turn to. Uh, I didn't know where to go in this situation. Um, and in society, you know, I had already, uh, being a gang member, being a, a, a delinquent, had all these labels on me, right, drop out, <coughs> And so you think of the ways that we uh, label people in our society, right? 
Um, for example, the word at risk. So we all are familiar with that word. So when we look at people like this, you, if you look at this image, I'm in the middle there, with, on, the, on the bottom there in black with a white hat. And then this is another image. This is um, a group of young people that I studied for my first book. And if you, if you look carefully, one of them's holding up a Hennessy bottle. He's 14 years old. One of them has a blunt in his mouth, a marijuana blunt. They're throwing up gang signs. They just uh, tagged up the wall. And um, in society, we're going to see them as at risk. Um, but if we change that perception, right, if we start to think of them as at promise, what happens is that our solutions come not from a risk-based perspective, but right, from an asset-based perspective. And if you just conduct that, it's a kind of a thought experiment, an exercise, right? Mm -hmm. uh, amongst yourselves, when you're discussing the populations you work with and you catch yourself kind of using a term that's deficit-based, you might kind of just say, oh, let's come up with an asset-based term for this. It used to be, remember when uh, those of you work with disabled students, Remember the terminology just 15, 20 years ago and how it's changed also with um, the gay, lesbian, queer, transgender community. Terminology has changed, right? So we have to, you know, people get caught up, oh, it's political correctness, but the minute we start to really dig into the science behind how we label people is the minute we start to be more reflexive and come up with solutions that are uh, asset-based, right? And when you have an asset-based solution, uh, the people you're trying to help react a little differently. They become more open and you get results. So, um, after my, my friend uh, passes away, um, I had no one. No one that I could count on, no adult, no friends. My friends were just getting into trouble. Um, and I went to the one place where one person had told me she would be there for me. I went to school to find my teacher. And this teacher, Miss Russ, you know, like, she's kind of like one of those institutional players. Kind of like D over there, you know, the minute you think of someone that's going to help, it's D, right? Someone's, oh, D, D, but D. Uh, also, a shout out to uh, Ms. Vasquez, right? We got the award, right? Estella Vasquez, shout out. Uh, you know, people like that, that, that do make a big difference. Um, then you know you can turn to them. And so she was one of those people. She was also the teacher that was always in your business. <laughs> she was the teacher that, at my adolescent stage, was really annoying to me. Uh, she was the teacher that, you know, I, one time I cussed her out and uh, she kicked me out, right, because she followed rules, high standards. As I'm leaving, I thought she was going to tell me what every other teacher had told me in the past, which is don't let the door hit you on the you know what, on your way out. But she says something different. She goes, hey, Victor. And I turn around, I give her a mean mug. <laughs> and um, she says, when you're ready, I'll be here for you. Right now you're not ready, but when you're ready, I'll be here for you. And that little message kind of came a little seed in my mind. And it wasn't until later that that I remembered what she said. So I go to school, I pay her a visit, I'm walking down the hallway. She comes out of her classroom. She says, Victor, are you okay? I heard what happened. And I'm trying to be a tough guy. and I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. She taps me on the shoulder and she says, I know you're not okay. And right when this lady taps me on the shoulder, all my pain, all my fear, all my anger began to grow and I began to cry like a little kid in front of the whole school. And I don't want it in that moment to melt away with my tears and drain into the gutter. This teacher 
opened up her arms. She gave me a hug. She said, Victor, I am here for you. If you're ready to change your life around, I'll be here for you. But you have to do the work. See, in this world of, of providing students an opportunity to live a second lifetime, we have to have walk a fine line of having high expectations with high opportunity. Because some of us have very high expectations, but nobody can reach them, <laughs> right? And then some of us, our colleagues would say, we get run over all the time by students because we have high opportunity, we provide them everything, but we have low expectations. Mm. So in this business, we have to have high expectations and high opportunity. Just like her expression, I'll be here for you, but you have to do the work. So emotional support is key to student motivation and transformation. Emotional support is meaningful contact. And it's a first step to culturally responsive education. I know there's a lot of trends right now in education, higher ed, in uh, K to 12. Cultural, is it cultural relevance, cultural proficiency, <coughs> cultural responsiveness? What is it? Someone tell me. It's tough, right? Yeah. I, I've got a PhD in ethnic studies, so I can't figure it out. <laughs> but what I'm trying to tell you is that the, at the core of any one of these uh, trends is really that emotional support. So we went out and conducted a survey of uh, 1,879 high school students. And uh, about 50% were uh, low income and about 50% were middle class. And it broke down by race as well. So the Latino students uh, were the low income for the most part. And the white students were the middle class and upper class for the most part. Right? There were some exceptions. And look at what we found. We found that for low income students, emotional support from educators was more important than for middle class students. So you see the red bars. The high bar, that's the low income students. The low red bar is the middle class students. And informational support was important for middle class students, but not as important as emotional support was for low income students. So what does this all mean? It's that going back to the very practical thing I talked about in the very beginning, the smile, the connection, Uh, at the community college level, believe it or not, here's an example of what the difference is between emotional support and informational support. Here it goes. Here's informational support. Um, so you know, uh, transfer applications are due uh, in a month, in December. And here's all the information you need, here's the packet. Um, let me know if you need anything. So that's informational support. You, get, you got the packet for them, you're handing them, you know, the information. They're ready. Uh, they have everything they need. What they decide to do, that's on them. They are the masters of their own destiny. Here's informational support, though. How are you doing today? Uh, listen. College, uh, transfer applications are in. You got about one month. I believe in you. You have the opportunity and the capability to make it. I believe in you. Let me know if you need anything from me. It's a little tweak. The emotional support feels a little bit better. And for a low income student, maybe even for a Latino student, haven't really pulled out, teased out whether it's ethnicity, culture, race, class, but in this case, right, we're doing class analysis. And for the low income student, that just feels 10 times better than being told here, fill this out. It's up to you. Yeah? Okay. 
So emotions matter in learning. Emotional states are associated with varying access to key parts of the brain required for learning. Negative emotional states like fear, anger, anxiety have been linked to inhibition of prefrontal cortex or thinking part of the brain. In other words, the part of the brain related to learning is also the part of the brain related to emotion. So if I am upset, I'm not going to be able to learn. Cognitively, that process gets blocked. So you want to sort of teach to the heart and then the mind will follow. Teach to the heart and then the mind will follow. We feel, therefore, we learn the relevance of effective and social neuroscience to education. Learning, attention, memory, decision making, and social functioning are both profoundly affected by and subsumed within the processes of emotion. So, okay, so, so far, right, we're talking about the ways in which our smiles, right, our conversations with students about how much we believe in them, about being there for them, our body language, right? um, how that all matters in our goal to reach higher education achievement for all of our students. So it doesn't conflict too much with your purpose because many of you became educators or came into the community college system for a reason. So right now, let's do a quick little exercise. So you can either write this down, you can text it to yourself. Most of you have phones on you. You can write it down just on a little piece of paper on the corner of your little agenda, just in one line. Or on your phone, you can text it to yourself. Um, or just think up the answer, but do something. Passive consumers of information. So on a small strip of paper, please answer in one line. Why did you decide to go into education? What is your purpose for working with community college students? What is your purpose for working with community college students? I'll give you 30 seconds. And then once you're ready to share with me, raise your hand. To help the community out. Why did you want to help the community out? What what was it in private industry you were not able to help the community out as much as you do now? You've always wanted to be a people service person. Why is that? Makes you feel good. Some of you thrive, feel good from helping others. I bet you most of you in here are that schema, that kind of person. I talk to educators all the time. This is our purpose. This is why we go into education. Like one of the purposes. I would like to give you a free copy of my book. If you want to meet me halfway, being a very volunteer. What's your name? Nancy. Thank you, Nancy, for serving the community. All right, who else wants to volunteer? Over, over there. I put down, and this is really why I did it, to change lives and to grow personally. To change lives and to grow personally. Wow. Why did you want to change lives? Well, I was involved with um, one-on-one -on -one counseling with the California Youth Authority when I graduated from Cal Poly. And I just felt kind of a, a calling to reach out. I got into a little bit of trouble when I was a youth. Okay, so you were both a counselor to youth that committed the most extreme crimes, and at the same time, when you were a youth, 
you had gotten into a little bit of trouble too. 13 years old. Wasn't well, a game, but I got into a little trouble, stole something. You stole something at 13. And that changes your trajectory. Now you want to help those people that have been through similar situations. So your purpose has been to help others that have been through similar situations as you, as you or worse. All right, your name? Brett. Brett? Thank you, Brett. Thank you. Okay, well, how about someone? Yes. So you like that process of transformation. It's like the metamorphosis that you're observing there kind of from, from semester to semester, year to year. I started out as a tutor, so for me it was, no, this problem, this paper, this lesson, this, but they take it away and they come back in the next lesson, they feel better, they see better. Your purpose is to see students grow and develop. And your name? Claire. Claire. Okay, I'll you a copy of my book. <laughs> I have one somewhere around. All right, after Claire, no more free books, all right? <laughs> all right, one more, one more free book. Yes? Detection fingers. Ooh. <laughs> so wait a minute. This is a beautiful institutional learning moment because now Dee is sharing her best practices Dee, you look young. I don't think you'll be retiring anytime soon, but <laughs> Dee needs to be sharing her best practices with people. And this is step one, Dee. Next time I come, I want to see like a giant binder of all your best practices. <laughs> yes? I wanted to help them get the education they needed into providing hope. Whoa. Get the education they needed and to provide hope. This is the business we're in, folks. We're in the people serving business. If you are burnt out or hate your job here, you know, remember your purpose, right? Because many of us did not come into this profession for the money. <laughs> we did it. Those of us that have those higher degrees, if we retrained ourselves, right, we could just maybe for a year or two got another a little bit masters or another masters so you have six masters degrees but like a professional masters where you go out and into the private sector you could be making 20% more of an income but you choose to stay you choose to be here and the choice is your purpose so don't ever forget your purpose and if you forget your purpose or your colleagues or the people you manage forget their purpose, do this exercise. And then my favorite part is you, uh, you, know, you tear out that little one-liner you wrote, you fold it up, you lose it in your pocket or your purse, and a few weeks later you're at the store shuffling through your pocket or your purse, and you find your purpose. And it reminds you, so find many ways to remind you of your purpose and to remind others of your purpose. So who do I give a free book to that I'm confused? Because that was the <laughs> All right, I'll give both of you a free book. <laughs> remind me I said that after, because I'll, I'll purposely forget that I said that. <laughs> you get a book. You get a book. Everybody gets a book. <laughs> I wish I was rich like Oprah, then I wouldn't give you free books. <laughs> All right. So because, because of people like you, in my case, it was a high school educator, but serving the same purpose, everything you mentioned, my teacher would tell you that was the reason she became an educator for, to be a people servant, to change lives, to watch the transformation process, to serve. Because of someone like you, who took the time and the empathy, not the sympathy, not the pity. You know, sympathy comes from like a place of pity, like, oh, poor, you know, in Spanish we say, pobrecito, you know? Oh, poor, you know, oh, that poor person, you know, like, oh, I feel sorry for them. 
Pobrecito, pobrecita. That, that place of, of pity makes us come up with a kind of threat-based, risk-based approaches. But if we say, oh wow, you know, um, you, there's another expression, and it's, it's more indigenous. It goes like this, um, you are my other me. Right? Like, we, we are somehow interconnected in this universe, and I need to treat you as if I were you and I was trying to help myself. Not to patronize, but to, to even ask yourself a question, am I, treat, am I treating this individual as if they were my child or my sibling? Would I give them this kind of treatment? And if the answer is no, you're not empathizing, you're sympathizing. Mm -hmm. And it's that emotion, and empath empathy is deep because then we go into emotional intelligence. Some of you in here are emotional architects, I can tell. Right, look at Dee, she sent a text message over here, <laughs> and all of a sudden, boom, you know, like the message gets out, like she's a social architect. But some of you are, um, could use a little bit more kind of like ref reflexivity in how do you, how do you um, read the situation in which a student needs you right now? So you're behind the desk, you're in your vehicle outside, and a student's walking by and they're looking kind of somber, or they're looking lost. Mario, Spinoza. And then you kind of just, oh, I better, you know, I'm checking my text. Here's a student. Oh, hey, hey, uh, how are you today? I hope you find anything. No, 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 it's okay. Oh, well, have a good day. All right. That's it. Back to your texting, checking your voicemail. All right. So, because of a teacher that, that believed in me, um, I was able to make it. After that moment, little by little, I started to change my life around. I went um, to zero period at 6.30 in the morning, catch up with my credits, two years of credits lost. And guess where else someone was offering, a block away from my school, credits that were equivalent to high school graduation credits. The community college. They helped me catch up with my high school credits. At the time, there was a program for that. And then, uh, I ended up being able to petition to graduate on time and with my class. And right around graduation time, I'm on top of the world. I got a high school diploma. My mom has a third grade education. Like, I've made it, right? Ms. Russ comes up to me and she says, Victor, I'm so proud of you. I knew you could do it. Now it's time to go to college. College me? Man, what is this teacher smoking thinking? I'm going to college. I'll become a mechanic, make $15 an hour, good to go. And then, convinces me, connects me with mentors from the community college and from the university. They talk to me about college. I apply to a couple of colleges. A few months later, I get a letter. Congratulations, you've been admitted to California State University. <laughs> so, um, it was one of these special programs because I had a 1.9 GPA. So it was one of these like second chance programs. What for one year you would take, I don't have the right proper term for, for this, but you would take remedial classes. There's another term for it now. Basic skills, Basic skills. see? See how the deficit remedial has changed? That's another example. Basic skills. One full year of basic skills at the Cal State. I know they've done away with it, now they're making you teach all that. 
But back then, they allowed me to take one four year, one full year of basic skills, and if I got a C or above, I could then transition into the regular major program. So the special program, you know, the letter said something like, you've been admitted under probationary status. Right? I didn't realize it was academic probation. I thought they was talking about criminal probation. <laughs> I said, probation? I'm already on probation. That don't matter. I really literally pictured a, a, a probation guy walking around with a can of mace, keeping an eye on me at the Cal State campus, make sure <laughs> I wasn't messing around with the other students. But I tell you, the, the, you you're going to have students that walk in literally from another planet, not knowing any other rules of engagement here. And sometimes our job is just to re-socialize them, right? You know this. And the base, and, and, and not get frustrated because we have to teach them some common sense things, some basics, right? So uh, I ended up graduating in four years, working full time. Uh, and uh, I said, man, after all I've been through, I want to get the highest degree awarded, the, the PhD. Um, so I applied to um, Berkeley, I get admitted, and four and a half years later, it takes seven years normative time to finish a PhD at Berkeley. Four and a half years later, in the year 2005, I became Dr. Victor Rios. So, um, in this journey, I learned a lot, and one of the things I learned was that a higher education isn't just success, and isn't just because someone told me to go get a higher education. Um, it became a, a very fast learning curve for me, and and then I realized like, oh, that's you know like it's funny that I didn't think about this when I was younger, but now I realize like, oh, that's why I became su successful. So an example is, right when I graduated with my PhD, I graduated on a Sunday, on a Monday, I'm at the bank asking for a home loan. And I get pre-approved, I was happy. And, uh, okay, some might argue it's during the time where everybody was getting approved. <laughs> <laughs> But I like to think it's because of my credentials. <laughs> um, I wish those times were still here. But anyway, um, I got approved, I got pre-approved, then I got, um, I went to go look for a home, and I found a home, uh, put in a bid, you know, got accepted, blah, 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 escrow, all that good stuff, get the key a few months later, a few weeks later, or whatever. Put the key in my pocket, drive it to my mom's dilapidated apartment. As you know, the kind of apartment you walk up the steps and it kind of rocks back and forth because it's so termite damaged. And I knock on her door and she opens the door. And you know that look a mom gives you after she hasn't seen you in a while? Ah, que paso, mi hijo. I'm nervous, my leg is shaking. Pull out the key and I said, Mom, I'm sorry you had to wait 30 years to live in a proper place to live. But here are the keys to your house. Aww. You see, educators, when I started, I said, some of the work you do is about life or death. It's about helping individuals achieve. It's about providing them keys to better opportunities in life. And not just provide for themselves, but provide for their families, for their communities, for others. And now I like to think that I, you know, in my work with youth that have been left behind, I pay it forward with the work that Ms. Russ did with me, with my mentors in the various institutions I've been um, navigating. And so, this work, at a very practical level, 
will require some very practical skills. And some of us have these skills, we just have to like figure out how to utilize them again. And some of us might have to push ourselves a little bit more. But if you want, I don't know, some of you may not have been here before, but you should go check out Trader Joe's. How many of you have been to Trader Joe's? Raise your hand. Who likes Trader Joe's? Raise your hand. <laughs> Officer, why do you like Trader Joe's? Who doesn't? What? <laughs> Free coffee. Free? Oh yeah, I had one last night. I couldn't fall asleep. <laughs> had a little shot. I'm very sensitive to coffee, but yeah, I was there last night and had a little shot of coffee. But why else? Their shirts. Their shirts? Oh, they got nice shirts. What else? They pay a living wage. They pay a living wage. They treat their employees good. They're nice. They're nice. What do you mean by that? They smile. They're friendly. They're welcoming. They make you feel important. They make you feel important. You hear this? What's your name? Andrea. Andrea. You have a great smile, by the way, Andrea. So, they smile. They're friendly. They make you feel important. <laughs> and they have great wine. It used to be two buck chuck, but I was like four buck chuck. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> so one day I get a text from home. You know, my wife, she asked me to go pick up some asparagus. So I stop at Trader Joe's on the way home. It had been a long day. I've been teaching all day at the university, and office hours, and, and trying to, you know, I really try, really try to just. And it's, it's exhausting, but you, you have to try, right? To like be happy in your work environment with other people so that they can feel like they belong, right? And then they respond back in a happy way and then you feel like you belong. Anyway, so I was exhausted. So I get to Trader Joe's and now my happy self turns off, right? <laughs> so I'm in line. <laughs> The Trader Joe employee, right? I put the asparagus on the counter and he goes, Hello, sir, how are you today? <laughs> and I was just like, Oh, I'm all right. Sir, what are you going to do with this asparagus? <laughs> and I was just like, I won't tell you what I was thinking. I was like, But, you know, I, I said, um, I was really terse. I said, oh, I'm going to cook it. <laughs> he goes, sir, this is what you do. You get home, you put on a saute pan, you throw a little olive oil in the saute pan, and you turn on the flame, and you wait until the oil starts to um, create white smoke. And you watch it, and right when the oil creates the white smoke, that's how you know the oil is ready, sir. And you throw the asparagus in the oil, and you saute it for a couple minutes, and you throw some uh, sea salt and crushed black pepper, sir, and you'll have an exquisite asparagus. <laughs> By this time, I'm like this. <laughs> wow, thank you, man. I pay him, I'm smiling. I get home, I try it, it worked perfectly. <laughs> the power that this employee at Trader Joe's had to change my own mood, and this is in the private sector. Imagine if we use that approach in the public sector, in the education system. And I even asked them sometimes, Hey, don't you get tired of being nice to people all day? <laughs> and one time one employee said to me, no, sir, because it's my job. Imagine if we said that to ourselves. It's my job to be nice to people all day, first and foremost. And then second, he says, and those guys, and he points to the pit where the managers sit, treat me like that every day too. So it's gotta be top down too. And 
so, how about I leave you with the Trader Joe's challenge? You wear all wear the Trader Joe's shirt yeah. one day and treat everyone nicely for the day and then maybe for the week and then for the month and then the semester and you see what happens, measure the outcomes. So even Forbes says, hey, why are Trader Joe's customers the most satisfied in America? It's the science. They know the science behind making people feel good. You might think it's the product, but it's really because they make you feel good when you're in there. All right, so really quick, in conclusion, I have about um, 10 minutes here, but in conclusion, um, I'm just going to leave you with some best practices, okay? Some, um, and and I, I gather them from Ms. Russ, but then over time in my research and looking at the literature, it's there, it's, it's prevalent. Um, so how do we create positive mindsets with our students, but also with our colleagues? We have to all understand where we're coming from. We have to share stories with each other. You know Mario's story a little bit, you know my story. Uh, you probably know each other's stories, and that's important. So inviting students to really uh, share where they're coming from, who they are, is so important. Um, when I was starting to change my life around, I went to Miss Russ, and I never really shared anything with her. I was pretty close, pretty private, and she started opening me, opening me up. And I don't know if you ever had this experience with like a student or even a friend that never really talks much, and then somehow they have this epiphany, and they're like wanting to talk about their life, and it's wonderful. But then they're just talking about their life all the time, all of a sudden, <laughs> and you're like, okay. So that was that person. I was like not talking about my life and all of a sudden I was sharing everything with Miss Russ and I think I was comfortable with her because she allowed me to see the assets that I brought to the education system even though everyone else has seen me as a deficit. I was a poor kid who had been a dropout. What did I have to offer the system? A lot of you work with uh, individuals and more and more with the changes in state policy, uh, individuals that are formerly incarcerated. And that's a big stigma. Some of us are afraid of them. Right? Some of us don't know how to react to them. It might be very implicit. We don't know that we're afraid of them, but we are. And that's the first step, is to admit we're afraid of them. Maybe not to them at that moment. <laughs> hey, I'm scared of you. But like, to ourselves, to each other, right? And then how do we walk through that situation and realize it? They're just people, too, trying to change their lives around. So um, understanding the different dimensions that people come from. So I was sharing my story a lot with Ms. Russ. And one of the stories I shared is that um, when we were little, we would go and get in line um, to get help from the government, maybe like Section 8 housing. But there's like a 30-year lottery, lottery for a Section 8. So we weren't going to get Section 8. But we did get cheese from the government. It was big blocks of cheese. So tell Miss Russ, yeah, we go get that cheese and we go make quesadillas, Miss Russ. She goes, oh, Victor, when life gives you cheese, make quesadillas. So she turns, right, think about it. She turns this negative thing about the poverty we're living in to like, oh, okay, you have learned to survive. That's understanding people's location, where they come from that you turn what they're doing already, um, not as a negative, but as a positive, if possible. She demonstrated a genuine interest in my learning, and this is where the self-actualization comes in, that it didn't matter what level of literacy I was in, maybe fifth grade, sixth grade literacy, my junior year of high school, um, she still believed that I could achieve. And this is what I call educator projected self-actualization. That you project so much someone's future for them that they have no choice but to believe you before they even believe in themselves. And here's a clear example. One day she said, Victor, one day you will advise presidents. <laughs> You're crazy, Miss Russ. I laughed at this lady. I shouldn't have laughed at her. Because two years ago, I found myself shaking President Obama's hand 
advising his administration on policing and gun violence in America. So if you want to shake the hand that shook Obama's hand, it's right here. I haven't watched it yet. You're welcome to shake it. Um, two months later, I'm at, invited to Vice President Joe Biden's house for dinner. I couldn't, you know, and all I kept thinking about was Ms. Russ. She saw this before I could even imagine it. She projected this for me right 20 years from when it actually occurred. Wow. If we could do that for our students, project for them, this is where you're gonna go. You follow these steps, right? You're, you're a survivor, let's also make you a thriver. These are the st steps it takes to be a thriver, and one day you will be here. And giving people that kind of hope and opportunity, right, it's a combination of hope and opportunity, provides them the steps, the know-how, how to get there. So that day at Joe Biden's house, I was nervous. It was fun, he asked me about my book, Punished. And um, you, know, you do know that uh, Dr. Biden, not Joe, I'm talking about the other Biden, Dr. Biden is a community college yep. educator. You know that. Yeah. Yeah. So we were talking about that too. So I was nervous, I go to the bathroom. <laughs> I can't believe I'm about to say this on camera, but okay. I wash my hands, and I see these little cute little napkins, right? And I'm like, whoa, the seal of the Vice President of the United States. So I dry my hand, throw it in the trash, grab a stack, put it in my pocket. <laughs> Button up my coat, go say my goodbyes. Came home with a little souvenir. <laughs> Guess you can take me out of Oakland, but you can't take Oakland out of Oakland. <laughs> so the final one is unconditional nurturing. Or this is the third one, I'm sorry, the third approach. And that is that no matter where people have been at, you still have to provide them the same opportunity you provide someone that might look more conventional to you, safer to you, uh, more of a potential to make it. Just provide everyone the unconditional opportunity to make it. And finally, consistency, that everything we do is consistent. We're gonna treat this person this way, this student this way, we should treat the other student this way. That everything's good, we have, you know, Sometimes we come up with conflicts. In that conflict, am I treating this student the same way I would treat this other student if we had the same exact conflict? And uh, I'll show you a little short video clip and we'll close it out. When I was this little, I told myself, man, school is not for me. Why do I want to go to school if it's not helping my mom pay the bills. I remember going hungry. And I remember seeing my mom cry. Cause she couldn't feed her kids. And I tell myself, man, I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to be poor. And I get caught up in the street life, in and out of juvie. In and out of juvie. Bouncing in and out. That's when it happened. Later on, you just decide you want to change. And there's no way you can change because it's too late. I see victim to a lot of these young people. You know, he's a person that struggled. That's what you have here. These young people, they must overcome barriers that young people shouldn't have to deal with, period. I just think about the Cebollas, Cebollas. Going back to the Victor story, it's kind of like, you know, when Victor would come over to the pad, it wasn't like, oh my God, I want this guy.
to be a professor, a Chicano professor. So, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't about that. It was just about hosting my little brother's friend at the pad. You know what I'm saying? So Martin calls me up and he says, Hey, Victor, I know you're a hot shot professor now, but I want you to come to Watts and talk to my kids. Come on, girls, have a seat. What's up, guys? We run a summer program. No funding. Come on in. And can you bring a team that will motivate these young people? Good to see you, bro. In my mind, I said, you know, hmm, I owe this guy. <laughs> But really, you can do this much. You're defying society's laws of expectations, right? Oh, I'm from college. I gotta be a thug. Or, you know, I went to this school, so that means I have to drop out. I hardly use the term drop out. I use the term push up. Drop out suggests that you've made a conscious decision to leave something. A lot of kids were pushed out of school and didn't leave school by choice. They just literally closed the doors in my face. They said, you're gonna be 18 already. Um, we will enroll you with the adult school. It breaks my heart to know that it's not possible. These girls and these guys coming in, a lot of them, there's a lot of pain. There's an opportunity to see themselves different. It's like, no, enough. You deserve to be treated with respect. You deserve to go out and get an education. I think it's something that you survive. Like, the most important that you identify these kids are hungry. They want to like gravitate to what you got to offer. Hey man, I can't do it. Oh, so that's it. Well, you're a big thing, baby. Great thing. But one way or another, I will see young people hit a switch, turn on that light, and just keep moving. Better you come with me, my baby. You got it. Martin Flores, he's still really cool, actually. He says to me. Brown people like us, we could go to college too, man. We believe in you, and we would love it that you believed in yourself so much that you could accomplish the unbelievable. So, my mentors believe in me so much, they tricked me into <laughs> believing in myself. Thank you very much for your time. development and as we move forward and serve our students and we're all here because we're passionate about education but I do want to tell you that we're contracting with Victor and he's going to be giving other talks throughout this academic year and uh, so you have to look forward to those opportunities but thanks again people like Victor. And I was thinking about uh, what Victor was saying about the opportunity to change that at risk to at promise. You know, for 25 years um, when I spent as a dean and a vice, pre a vice president, I taught one math class each uh, semester. For a long time, it was a special elementary algebra course for designed for reentry students. We were trying to change the culture of reentry students coming back to college and being in a classroom with 19 and 20 year olds who could not relate at all to what the experience is like for somebody coming back to school in their 30s and 40s. And being in a classroom which was managed for 19 and 20 year olds 
and feeling like, they're feeling like a fish out of water. And so we recreated these series of courses of a reentry program, and I, I co-taught this math class with B.C. Ralston, one of our counselors, who had a math background. And we kind of did a tag team thing. You know, she was, she had developed a course about dealing with math anxiety. And I was there to break down a stereotypical experience that most women students coming back to school had, that male math teachers think you can't learn math. And so they were labeled. And so I was, you know, we kind of played a good cop, bad cop um, arrangement, but VC uh, was able to bring in the strategies about taking away the fear of math. And my job was to break down the stereotypical thinking about women learning mathematics, because most of our reentry students were women in their 30s and 40s. And I remember one of the, early on in that experience, I had two amazing reentry students who were scared to death about taking math. One of them was Julianne Jackson, <laughs> and the other was Dee Lalonde. <laughs> And I'm very, and I'm honored that, um, that I made a difference in their lives. And they keep reminding me of that, that experience they had of getting over, no, no, I didn't, you know, they actually did really well. But it was that, that was changing the fear into confidence. And, you know, there's nobody more powerfully filled with confidence than Julianne and Dee, and they make a difference every day. But they never forget where they were and what they've accomplished as they've continued giving back year after year after year to the students who choose to come to Western College. Victor, thank you. Thank you very much for reminding me of that. Why did I choose education? Because I was a really good math student. And so and engineering was where I was being directed by uh, my school counselor. But I was also very tied into being a student athlete. And coaches were extremely powerfully strong influence in my life. Because I was in a, a single parent home with a mom with a high school education. Uh, who really wanted me to go to college, but she had no idea how to do that. So the coaches were the most closely related to me. So somehow, I didn't want to stray away from athletics because that had such a powerful influence on developing who I was. So I thought, what can I do to marry those two skills? I'll be a teacher. That way I can teach math and I can coach and I can keep those two things connected. And I want to be the greatest math te high school math teacher that ever lived. So I started teaching high school math and coaching football and baseball. And how did I end up at Quest of College? Because I wanted to coach football at the college level. Not knowing what, what journey these last 50 years would mean. And how grateful I am to have the opportunity to be mentored and to be guided and options suggested to me that I never would have dreamed of by myself. Uh, at opening day back in August, I had the opportunity when I announced that I was going to be retiring that I had in the audience Dr. Frank Martinez, the second president of Cuesta College, who then, in 1967, and today, in 2018, is still my mentor. At 96 years old, he still calls me almost every day and says, what'd you do wrong today? <laughs> but he was the one, as Victor was saying, would always plant that seed. Have you ever considered about going into administration? Oh, Frank, I don't want to think about that. So what happens? You start thinking about it. And you start suddenly opening your eyes to opportunities. You know, have you ever thought about getting your doctorate? 
not, you know, I've got five little kids, how can I afford the time and the energy to do that? Well, just think about it. So the next thing I know, I'm looking for a doctoral program, and I get that program. That's the kind of person the Miss Rubs was in my life, that Victor was describing. I didn't plan on saying that. It's not a script. <laughs> but I'm sure all of you are thinking about things you haven't thought about because of Victor's words. And that's the purpose of Victor place on this earth is to help us think of ways in which not only we were influenced by people, but all the opportunities we have to influence others. So we are in a transition period. I call this the end meets the beginning. Um, and how many of you um, were not here before 2010? Raise your hand if you were not here before 2010. So all you know about Costa College is what you see today. Others of you have a more rich history of Costa College. But we're about ready to we're about ready to transition <clears throat> into a life with our seventh president of Cuesta College. So I want to take us back in time, and I want to retrace the steps that have gone before us as we've transitioned from president to president, and what that looked like, what that felt like, and where I think we are going to go in the next era. So I'm going to take you back to 1959. Let's see where we going. 1959? Well, that was the year I graduated from high school. In the spring of 1959, just prior to my graduation from San Luis Obispo High School, San Luis Obispo Junior College was informed that it was losing its accreditation and would need to close. Oh my God, that feels awful. We were there once, weren't we really close? The college, which was housed on the high school campus, had been in operation since 1936. In the absence of a local junior college, our local high school students had to either go to Allen Hancock, Taft College, College of Sequoias, or Hartnell. <clears throat> and local property taxes would follow those students in order to support the cost of educating them in another district. So finally, can I get this queued up here? Yeah, okay, thank you. So finally, in, 19, in April of 1963, the voters of San Luis Obispo County approved the formation of the San Luis Obispo County Junior College District. Dr. Merlin Eisenbach was appointed as the first president, and he in turn chose his Citrus College colleague, Dr. Frank Martinez, to be his vice president for instruction. Together with a large card, card, cardboard box, a leased, um, a leased office, the County Office of Education, the college was born. Originally targeting the fall of 1965 start, it was learned that Alan Hancock was infiltrating the South County with classes. Some things just don't change. Do they? <laughs> I was for you, uh, Trustee Sizak. Yeah. <laughs> To offset this southern assault, Dr. Martinez wrote the entire curriculum and evening classes were offered in the fall of 1964. They were held at San Luis Obispo Junior High School, Paso Robles High School, Atascadero High School, and Arroyo Grande High School. The enrollment that first semester was 463 students and all teachers were part-time. The first classified employee and just the fourth person overall to be hired by the college was none other than Elaine Holly Coates, who we honor today by presenting uh, Ella, uh, Estella Vasquez, uh, her award. She served as a secretary to the superintendent president as well as to two assistant superintendents. Following her retirement in 1992, she returned on a part-time hourly basis in 1993 working in various offices, including the foundation, until 2008. Also, during that 1964-65 year, the first full-time faculty and staff were hired. First, the eight division chairs, and then 30 other faculty hires were made to round out the original full-time faculty. 
Notice the dress code in those days. <laughs> Looks very different today. We have, you know who's right in there? Is Chris Gilbert. He's always in a tie. And who would not fit there would be Dr. Joe Bosto. <laughs> By the 1965 fall semester, property had been secured over across the creek at Camp San Luis Obispo, and barracks, mess halls, and other facilities were refurbished to hold classes. The full schedule of day and evening classes was developed with 917 day students and 991 evening students enrolling. On October 4th, 1965, the name Cuesta College was officially chosen following a very spirited balloting process, which included other possible names such as Tolosa, Santa Lucia, and even Frog Hollow. <laughs> In November 1966, a construction bond measure was placed before the county voters for $12 million, which would have built the entire campus. It was rejected by the voters. By 1967, when I joined the Quest of Faculty, you can guess which one is me. <laughs> A distinguishing characteristic. <laughs> we didn't have many amenities in terms of classrooms and campus surroundings, but what we did have was an amazing camaraderie and pioneering spirit. All of our mailboxes were in the same place, so you regularly saw colleagues from all other disciplines. Even our two uh, English faculty members, uh, Dan Canny and Joe Caesar, who were uh, doing some strange things at a football game, much to the chagrin of C. Fred Brighetti in that picture. In 1968, the Western Association of Schools and Colleges granted Cuesta College its first accreditation, initially for a three-year period. This meant the Cuesta could now apply for federal and state financial assistance to upgrade temporary campus buildings on the National Guard site. The second decade of Cuesta's history <laughs> featured continued rapid growth, developing a master plan for the campus, passing two construction bonds, and building a campus. In 1970, following the purchase of 150 acres of military property adjacent to Highway 1, property upon which we are located today. The voters approved our first construction bond for five million dollars. In 1970, a military chapel, which is located over by the Hollister Adobe on that corner, that was converted into the Interact Theater, seating 150 patrons, thus replacing the original theater on the old campus called the Playbox. It seated 30 people. On October 15, 1970, a groundbreaking ceremony was held on the site where the men's physical education shower and locker room would be built in 1972. Here you see the looking uh, from the uh, locker room towards uh, the, the science complex. This was the 1100. About seven years later, the pool was actually put uh, to the left of that on that screen. The science complex. <clears throat> and the science complex opened in 1973. These buildings contained state-of-the-art equipment featuring the latest technology for the time, such as remote slide projectors, <laughs> movies controlled from the podium in the science forum, and an electronic periodic chart that featured lighted chemical elements. The physics lab, and an HP 45 scientific calculator cabled to every lab station. They were purchased for $450 each. This was a technology that's available today in many cereal boxes as a prize. <laughs> but these facilities were wonderful for the time. As each of these projects was completed, faculty and staff moved from what we call the old campus to the new campus. It was challenging for students, especially if they had back-to-back -back classes on both sites, getting to and from class. It was also in 1973 that the Cuesta College Foundation was formed for the purpose of raising gifts to support student scholarships. A, construction, a second construction bond for $8.5 million was approved on November 5, 1974, 
which provided for funding for much of the remaining purpose, permanent campus. This is the 70s now. Sorry to... Yeah, look, look at the dress of those days. I've never seen lapels that way. It looks like the flight deck of an aircraft carrier. <laughs> but what a handsome and debonair looking guy. <laughs> One of my sons looks just like that now. It's really, it's really scary. Yeah. During the 1974-76, the library, business and engineering classrooms, the cafeteria, bookstore, <coughs> business and engineering offices, language arts classrooms, and the language arts, social and science office buildings were completed. And in 1977, the humanities forum was open for instruction. During this very active period of construction, with faculty and staff relocating from the old campus to the new site, a change began to take place that affected the close working relationships that we had with each other. Not only did we have a split college on two different sites, but the new campus culture featured programs and staff organizing clusters of buildings. No more were the common area for mailboxes. No more were the opportunities just to run into a colleague from another division. We, what used to happen naturally required much effort by everyone to stay connected. Dr. Eisenheis retired in early 1977, and Dr. Frank Martinez was appointed as the second president of Cuesta College on February 19, 1977. During his first year as president, the gymnasium, the auto welding and electronics labs, and the snack shelter, that beautiful structure that looks like an old McDonald's, uh, were completed. Thank God the new building, when it comes, is going to take that out. On June 6, 1978, shortly into the second year of Dr. Martinez's presidency, Proposition 13, titled The People's Initiative to Limit Property Taxation, was approved by the voters. This landmark legislative amendment stripped the authority of local boards and trustees to set local property taxes to support schools and colleges. The limit on property tax growth and the funding of schools and colleges shifted to state control. The impact on Cuesta College was devastating. Classes were eliminated, operating budgets were frozen, hiring freezes were enforced, all off-campus classes, centers, and coordinators were suspended, and the most dastardly deed of all was committed. Intercollegiate football was eliminated. <laughs> the name of the game was survival. In spring of 1979, the college established two off-campus centers, one at Templeton High School and the other at Rory Grandy High School. Not only classes offered, but also services as well. The decade of the 80s didn't start much better than the 70s ended. The college was, however, with the remaining construction bond money, able to build the current administration building, even though it ended up half of its original size. The president's office, administrative services, and human resources all moved from the library building to the new building. In the early 80s, California faced another economic downturn, leading to a recession in 1982. The state, in an attempt to limit certain types of classes that were offering, published its first hit list, classes that would no longer be funded. The state and the college slowly recovered, followed by improved funding and enrollment growth. In the absence of football, the swimming pool complex was completed, men's and women's swimming were added, men's water polo was introduced, as well as women's basketball and softball. As the 80s came to a close, rapid growth led to many new faculty hires in 1988 and 1989. It also meant the end of another decade and the change of presidents. Dr. Martinez retired in 1988, and Dr. Grace Mitchell became the third president of Cuesta College, taking office on March 15, 1989. The students voted to tax themselves for the purpose of building a student center that future students in the years would come to enjoy. The building in which we reside right now was a result of that taxation, and that's why this is called the Associated Students uh, Auditorium. The decade of the 90s was one of change, planning, adjustment to a new downturn in the economy, unionization, community outreach, expansion, 
and new school colors. The state of comedy began to turn downward in the early 90s, keeps a repetitive theme, creating a climate of limited resource and many demands. No new buildings have been built in 10 years, but additional space was needed. Expansion took place by means of leasing multiple portable buildings to accommodate the foundation, community programs, faculty offices, associated students, the Student Health Center, and academic administration. In October 1994, the Student Center and Expanded uh, Bookstore opened for business. The revenue collected from the Student Center fee combined with Bookstore products provided a revenue stream to pay off the, uh, the bar pay off the money borrowed to build this very important complex. The faculty voted to enter the arena of collective bargaining in 1994, and the first collective bargaining agreement was ratified on October 2nd, 1996. Even though funding was flat, it was a perfect time to plan for the next 20 years. The first educational facilities master plan since the late 60s was written, which identified future programs, services, buildings, and expanded campus sites, as well as a timeline for implementation. Proposals for new buildings were submitted to the state of, for the state for consideration so that as construction funds became available, Cuesta College would be in a position to resend, receive funding. As the state recovered from its economic woes, funding for community colleges improved with an emphasis on growth. Quest grew steadily through the mid to late 90s, reaching an enrollment high in 1998. In 1995, the Allied Health and Nursing Building was completed and, aimed, and named in honor of Ada Irving, who was an avid supporter of health sciences and a major donor to the program. Over the previous two decades, citizens of the North County consistently reminded the board and the college president that the Quest had not delivered its promise to build a campus north of Cuesta Grade. As the college struggled with finding the resources to purchase land and then find funding to build buildings, a group of very eager, influential North County residents met with Dr. Mitchell and, I use the word insisted, that they really demanded, on helping the college secure a site and raise the money to have a campus. The foundation, under the leadership of Dr. Barbara George, was called upon to engage in its very first capital campaign, a major departure from the role of primarily providing funds for scholarships. The $4 million support that came forth from private donors, businesses, and organizations was phenomenal. A piece of land was identified on Buena Vista as a suitable site located off Highway 46 and Pass Robles. And in July of 1996, this wonderful couple, John and Bernard Allen, bought the 82-acre parcel for $435,000 and held it interest-free until the college could receive funding from a state bond to pay them back. $2 million worth of portable buildings were secured through a surplus program in Vandenberg Air Force Base thanks to the bird-dogging of, at that time, Police Chief Pete Sizak, who was always watching that list and saw those buildings come up and jumped in there. We got first in line for those buildings. And the only cost to us was moving them from Vandenberg up to the North County. In addition to that, the city of Paso Robles reached out and, and annexed the college property to allow us to have access to city services. So much work took place to ready the new campus for students but the doors opened on August 17, 1998 to 1,292 very appreciative students. Later that fall, in December of 1998, the late Russ Kiesig and his wife Carol donated an additional 23 acres adjacent to the North County uh, campus property, which is still under our ownership today. The decade of the 90s closed with a familiar ring to it. The retirement of the president, Dr. Mitchell, in 1998, and the arrival of Cuesta's fourth president, Dr. Marie Rosenwasser, on October 1st, 1999. Near the end of the 90s, the voters of California passed construction bonds that allowed Cuesta College to make significant progress in completing the facility development plan outlined in the facilities master plan. 
Construction began in the early, in early of 2000 for the fine arts and music uh, remodel and expansion project, which provided new photography and digital art labs, lecture hall, recording studio, offices, and the art gallery. Also under construction were the Children's Center and Human Development Classroom and Offices. This new facility paved the way for the Children's Center to move from what we call then the old campus on the other side of the creek, where it resided all by itself for 14 years. And Don felt, finally felt like he was accepted into the family. <laughs> also under construction, with the help of another capital campaign, uh, managed by the foundation of $2 million was a high-tech center. These projects were completed in 2002 and helped catapult the college into the computer network era. The new millennium found Quest turning to the web to automate many of the services that were provided to students, such as course history, financial aid status, ordering transcripts, holds on records, and registration. State funding for community colleges took another hit as California struggled to stabilize its economy. For the first time, categorical programs were cut by 30 to 40 percent, with matriculation and DSPS being impacted the hardest. Both areas suffered staff reductions as well as other positions on campus being affected, resulting in workload reductions. Distance learning became the new buzzword and students were searching for classes and program options that would make their education more flexible to fit their complex lives involving work, family, and child care. No longer were students interested in taking a five-day-a-week algebra class, but were demanding Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Tuesday, Thursday options, or Monday, Wednesday options. The Educational Facilities Master Plan was updated in 2003, and the first permanent building on the North County campus was completed in the summer of 2005. With the addition of the Fox Building, enrollment rose to 4,000 students by the 2009 spring, reg uh, spring registration. State funding was approved for the <clears throat> library expansion project after a five-year wait, and the library expansion was completed in 2006. Only one project from the original facilities master plan for the San Luis Obispo campus re, uh, remained, and that was the theater. First planned in the mid-90s, construction was finally started in 2006. Dr. Rosen reti Rosenwasser retired in 2006, and Dr. Dave Pelham became the fifth president, arriving in March of 2008. After just getting the seat warm, Dr. Pelham left the college after a short stay at the end of 2009. Today, we appreciate the efforts of those faculty, staff, and administrators that put a vision for a theater on paper, worked with architects and planners, and saw their dream put on hold time after time. Some of those left the college, some new faces came on board and tweaked the project and many are still here today celebrating their collective dream, their contributions, and their legacy for the future. So here we are, nearing the end of the second decade of the 21st century, rebounding from another economic downturn and preparing for the arrival of the seventh president of Cuesta College. The California Community Colleges are still the most important and most unique system of higher education in the world. We open our doors to anyone who has a desire to improve his or her life. As I've said many times before, we are the come as you are college. We welcome the victors in our district. We stand ready to serve when our students are ready to be served. The challenges are absolutely significant. But the opportunities are endless for us to facilitate the success of so many. So where do we go from here? On January 15th, 19, or 2010, I shared, an open, I shared an opening day with our entire employee group in the theater, some of whom are here today, a vision of what I wanted this college to become. I would like to revisit that vision this morning, 
so that we can all kind of embrace, I think, what I think are the important aspects of a successful college. And what I said was, in the future, we will be a college that can live within the funding provided by the state legislature. We will be a college that will be doing less, but with an elevated level of excellence and a greater sense of pride. We will be a college that with the help of institutional advancement will aggressively pursue private gift support. We will be a college that will provide its staff and students with a sense of certainty, a certainty of continued employment, and a certainty of classical delivery. We will be a college where trust is a creed to live by. We will be a college where each employee will assume responsibility to make Cuesta an excellent place to work and an excellent place to learn. We will be a college that celebrates its history and honors its retirees and our alumni. We will be a college where consultation is a welcome process and it is clearly understood that the president is charged with making the final decision. We will be a college that serves our students with dignity and respect. And we will be a college that serves each other with dignity and respect. And we will be a college where creating our own legacy for the next decade of employees and students will be our passion and not our obligation. So the, his the future of Cuesta College, with the transition into with the, the seventh president, is in your hands. May the force be with you. <laughs> Thank you very much. go back to work. <laughs> now, thank you very much for your attendance today, your interest, your, your, your solid concentration on, I just watched and listened and saw how, how struck you were with the message that Dr. Rios shared with us today and how fitting it kind of all tied together of where we were, where I was thinking of going and where um, he led us uh, this morning. So I am so proud of this institution, I'm very proud of you. Uh, and I have great confidence that whatever direction we move in, in the future, we have put into place so many of our operational and decision-making processes that are now owned by you. That when selecting a new president, we hope to find a president that can adapt to our culture and embrace what we've accomplished over the last eight years. And yet, be a leader who will challenge us, will have new ideas to help improve of what we stand for today. That is my hope for you, and that is my hope for this institution, and I will be watching. <laughs>